start shortly. Order. Welcome to this uh, session of the Justice uh, Committee, uh, where we're uh, taking evidence, the final evidence session in relation into our inquiry uh, on the uh, probate service. Um, welcome to our witnesses. Uh, grateful to, to, to see you both, Minister and Ms. Measures, and I'll ask to come to you in a moment. Um, but first of all, uh, the members have to make their declarations of interest. Uh, I'm a non practising uh, barrister uh, and I'm a consultant to a law firm, Mr. Timpson. I'm a barrister with a current practising certificate but not undertaking any direct court work. I'm a former Solicitor General, former Chair of CAFCAS, former Chair of the National Child Safeguarding Practice Review Panel. My brother is Chair of the Prison Reform Trust and I'm currently advising ministers on family justice policy. <laughs> yep. Over the other side for a bit. Um, <laughs> yes, Minkurashi. I'm a barrister but not practising, although I have a dual tenancy but not a practising certificate. I used to work with the Crown Prosecution Service and I was at the independent bar as well for many years. I have two members of family who are both practising lawyers at the moment. Um, Very comprehensive. Mr Sharon Ambus. I'm Sharon Ambus, non-practising solicitor. Mr. Uh, Andy Carter, currently a member of the Merseyside bench. Uh, Deanna Davis, and nothing relevant to declare, you'll be pleased to know. <laughs> right. OK, Mr. Well, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself and as measures, please, Minister. Uh, I, I'm Mike Freer, the Minister for Courts and Legal Services. Uh, that's quite a right, wide, wide-ranging portfolio, but for the purpose of today, it includes the oversight of the probate service. Um, and then um, Helen Measures is a relatively new appointment. I um, can't remember its operations. It's National Services National Director. Services Director. Um, but in terms of, uh, has been recently appointed within the last couple of months uh, to help us on the recovery plan for the probate service. Yeah. Okay. Well, I understand this measures that uh, uh, you're, you're new to this particular area, but you'll understand that uh, we'll be asking some of the things yeah. about, which I hope you <coughs> within your, your corporate knowledge, if I can yeah. Yeah. Uh, put it that way. Um, first thing I wanted to do, Minister, is just start off with where we are. Um, We've all seen the evidence, and your department's submitted evidence, amongst others, uh, about the situation. Nobody seems to dispute that there has been a serious backlog. Um, it's, it, we're told uh, that that backlog has improved equally. Um, we've had some evidence to raise concerns about how that's going to be sustained. So let's look at the current position. What's the current position on performance of the probate registry? If I may, uh, well, first of all, I think I've had this um, service in my portfolio since I was first appointed to the MOJ, and I think it's true to say that uh, both the department and the team looking after it um, recognise that the service has not been delivering, um, certainly in the past, although I do believe we are now on a good trajectory. And for, th for the level of service failures... Um, clearly we are very unhappy and we apologise profusely because we realise when people are going through probate it can be an extremely difficult uh, time of their lives whilst they're dealing with bereavement. Um, from my point of view I have paid a significant amount of time on this service trying to understand um, some of the key uh, metrics and what's been going wrong and working quite closely with the senior officials to put a recovery plan in place um, to both ensure that the recruitment plan, because we have recruited a significant number of people, over 100 people in the past year, uh, to boost the number of full-time staff and then improving the level of productivity. Quite a lot of work has, been, has gone into understanding the processes and where the processes are going. Well, if I may be honest and say, uh, one of my concerns was driven by the postbag from colleagues. Yes. Um, certainly when I took on this role, I would imagine about 60% of my post bag were complaints about <coughs> And the officials know, I'm not speaking out of turn, that I was extremely unhappy with the level of delays between receipt and processing and grants. Where we are today, um, not only have we seen a significant turnaround in the answering of the phones, so for instance, uh, when I took on the portfolio, the average time waiting to have the phone answered was 56 minutes. It is now usually under 12, and whilst we think that's still too high, it's a significant improvement. Uh, we have cleared a significant amount of the backlog, uh, and uh, Ms. Bezos will be able to tell you the exact figures, but broadly speaking, for the last seven months, um, grants of probate have outstripped receipts, which is a significant improvement. And so 
as well as seeing that level of productivity improve, there's been an awful lot of work going on to clear the backlog, going into the oldest cases first and finding out what has gone wrong and then fixing it. Because some of it may, is, is being blunt, some of it is, is the failure of the service where things have simply fallen through the cracks. Um, some of it has been a lack of uh, knowledge or skill by, it's quite a dedicated team in Birmingham, I've been to see them, uh, but have perhaps not been as well trained and that has been rectified. And on top of that, we do continue to have problems where people submit applications that are incomplete. So we've also looked at how both the professionals and, if you like, the domestic applicant, the forms they use, the digital system, to make sure that it is as clear as possible um, so that the info as soon as we get all the information we need, we can process it as fast as possible. So on, at the moment, the average time for all applications is about nine weeks. Um, for uh, paper, it actually is, for digital is eight weeks, and for paper, it is about 18 weeks. Um, and that actually is a significant improvement on where it was. It's still not where we want it to be. And I'm hoping that by... September, uh, we will get back down to where we were pre-COVID. Now, as you say, that is an improvement, but it's starting from a, an unsatisfactory base. I mean, in terms of the, um, if you like, probate recovery plan, we're interested to know what are the key elements and the performance indicators. I don't know if Ms. Measures, if you can help us with that, or yourself, Minister. Yeah. So there were four areas of the recovery plan. So we introduced that in June, July last year. The areas are capability, so that was bring, bringing up the capability of the teams involved. So we've, uh, the Minister's already touched on the, uh, the training that we needed to do uh, for the team. The second area was productivity, yes. so rather than spending a long time answering queries um, on the phone, we were putting, we needed to put more people on examining cases to increase the productivity and the grant output. Uh, related to that, we also had a stronger drive on performance, so setting some expectations over what we needed the team to do. And then finally, we looked at resources, and that's partly why we increased the number of people working um, in the service in order to um, improve our ability <coughs> to do more cases. So they were the main areas that we um, looked at, um, and the recovery plan is, is structured on that. There are a range of things that we use in order to uh, measure the success against that. Um, so that includes the fact that we would be uh, wanting to dispose of more cases than we're receiving. We also look at average weight, and um, Minister's already touched on some of the data relating to that. We also look at the age distribution, so the, um, the sort of our very oldest cases, why they are there, how many of them have we got, and as a result of looking at that, we're targeting our oldest cases first. And then also, just two final points, we look at the average speed to answer, the Minister's already mentioned that, and then we also look at our, um, the speed at which we respond to correspondence. Um, so we've, we've significantly improved that area as well, so responding to everything within 10 days. But and that's your target, that's, that's a firm target for 10 Yes, days. that is, yeah, and we're achieving that at the moment. Okay. I mean, are, are we going to get rid of this uh, uh, four months, 16 week wait before people answer queries? We are looking at that. Um, so the reason why we set it at 16 week is, is so that it gives us a bit of um, space, if I'm being honest. But um, I think it's reasonable to say that when we're in a steady state, we could bring that forward. And um, people can still contact us before the 16 week point. There are ways that they can contact us. There's no way. Um, so, um, yeah. But they're not going to find out very much, are they? Experience mm. tells us. Well, if I can tell you, well, that one of the problems that we looked at it. So I've looked, I spend uh, probably a disproportionate amount of my yeah. time on this okay. service. And one of the issues was people were phoning up asking, have you got it? Have you issued it? What's the problem? And of course, that actually then slowed down the whole process. Mm -hmm. So it became actually self-defeating. Mm -hmm. And so by extending, please don't contact us for 16 weeks, it gave the team breathing space to start clearing the backlog without... Because if you're answering the phone, you can't necessarily be clearing the, the backlog. And so it gave the team some breathing space. And that's why what we've seen is we have seen this uh, significant improvement of, of the grants outstripping receipts. The other thing that has made a difference, and I, uh, as Helen will know, I took some persuading um, to uh, reduce the um, telephone operating hours um, to make sure that if we were going to restrict telephone hours, I want you to be absolutely convinced that it would have an impact on productivity um, because as we know in other parts of government that has not been seen um, what we have seen and we've seen um, 
feedback from stakeholders that actually they've seen a marked improvement in the service because we are closing the phone lines in the afternoons, Monday to Friday. So that allows the teams to focus on grants. So um, I think once we see if we can continue this trajectory of, of, of grants outstripping receipts, the 16 weeks should be able to come back to the norm. As I've been asked before, um, we've known each other for a long time. Before you came into politics, you had senior roles in, in business. Um, you know, in any customer-facing service, 16 weeks before you can actually get a response to what's happening uh, is... Well, nobody did last in business doing that, would they? I, I, as, as, as you know, Sir Bob, I'm a bit of a stato. I'm sorry, I did spend quite a lot of time with the team going through the actual processes. And uh, let's just say there were some frank and robust conversations between myself and the senior management team. Glad to hear it. <laughs> Mr Carter. Uh, Minister, you, you mentioned sort of learning from other areas in, in government. I mean, I, I've just renewed my passport, and I had an update every day from the passport office telling me they received it, they were processing it, and it was back with me within a week. Um, is, is the department looking at other areas like the passport office to learn how to communicate with its stakeholders to ensure that you don't need a phone call? I didn't need to phone call any, anybody at the passport office because they were communicating with me on exactly what was going on. So we're, target, we're basically putting all of our energy at the moment into improving the service so that people don't need to be waiting, frankly. So we want our resource to go, going into examining the cases and issuing the grants and issuing as many as we can. We're open-minded to, um, you know, if other government departments are doing other things, we have all ourselves introduced a range of different methods of engaging with the stakeholders. And so we've had all sorts of webinars and such like. But I, I do see your point. If you don't mind, can I just push back? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a very, very good system working in the passport office. It wasn't 12 months ago, but yeah. they've got it right. Is this an opportunity to go and look at what they're doing and perhaps bring that, yes. put it straight in? Thank you. That's, that's a good start. Um, can you just help me about one other thing? Um, you've done work, I can see that, efforts to get the backlog down, but what we picked up from many practitioners is, of course, I won't say death is seasonal, but there are air, p- periods of time we're sadly, particularly during the winter with an ageing population, more people sadly will die, and that will mean in due course that the probate comes through. So all the practitioners we've spoken to say April, March is a sort of a peak time. Uh, the number of applications goes up. How has that fared in relation to the latest performance? Well, it's two things. Firstly, um, the broad answer is that we have not seen the death rate go back to pre-COVID levels. The death rate has remained high, uh, and that obviously is why we've resourced up um, but I don't think it's, we've seen any influx. So, so far, we've not yet seen a sudden influx in April or May. No, we've seen a very modest increase, but it's not a significant increase. We also have statisticians that work in our workforce management team, to, um, and we look at the death rate data to forecast our receipts. So again, we, and, and at the moment, receipts are actually tracking below forecast. Um, so, yeah, but it's something we monitor very closely. And I suppose the question mark is... What, are we, what, what assurances can you give us that this downward trajectory is going to continue over the next two, three months? Is actually going to be sustained? That's the, the, the real question that people are, are raising. Um, well, nothing's ever cast in stone, but I, I, for, given that the last seven months we have seen consistent, consistently answering the phones yep. um, under, under 12 minutes, we've seen consistently for seven months out, you know, grants outstripping receipts. Um, so I'm confident that we will, by September, get back to normal service levels that we had pre-COVID. Now, you know, if there's a natural disaster in terms of another pandemic, um, if other things change, but given what I know today, I'm confident that the service is now on an even keel to deliver the service that we want to deliver, not what it has been delivering. Uh, the problem is we, we spoke to some actually users, all lay people, earlier today uh, on Teams. Um, of the various people that we spoke to, only a small sample, um, applications were put in mostly online, only one on paper. Um, September 23, nothing yet. December uh, 23, yes, actually March 24. Uh, all the others, January 24, March 24, March 24, nothing so, so, so far. Um, interesting that the one person who got an answer was the one person who eventually managed to speak to someone on the phone. Have we actually sort of cut back too much on the availability of personal contact and staff who can actually 
deal with people one to one and sort things out. That used to be what happened in the old days with the probate registries. Well, all I can say, I mean, you know, Helen will be able to give you more detail, but I have spent quite a lot of time in Birmingham listening to yeah. the call handlers, yeah. mm. and the calls do take quite a lot of time mm. um, because often the queries can be complex. Um, but in, in terms of, there can be a variety of reasons. So when I started seeing the correspondence, why, you know, I sent it in on this month, it took me two months. To, you know, the service to look at it, then another four months to actually deal with it. We really started digging to find out. And there were some complete, um, so things fell through the yes. cracks. That's absolutely true. But what's also true is that sometimes the application is not complete. So you don't get the, the original will. You have pages missing. Some of the times the forms are not uh, completed. One of the big problems we encountered, which we've now addressed by direct feed from um, the revenue, is despite the form, paper form saying do not send um, without the IHT code, people would send it in um, incomplete and then we'd have to wait for the IHT code. So sometimes the delays are not, hand on heart sometimes it is entirely down to the services getting it wrong, but equally sometimes the forms and the, the application can be incomplete. Then the service will go back to the customer and request clarification or request further information. Sometimes that comes in very promptly and the grant can flow quickly. Sometimes that t takes a while to come back. So there can be a variety of issues. I'm not going to, yeah. hand on heart, trying to defend yeah, no. the service entirely, but the service aren't entirely um, to blame either. It can be a mixture of reasons why things go slow. Of course, since I think it's January, isn't it, of, of this year, you don't have to send, in fact, you, you don't send an IHT 421 that's form the, that's, anymore. That's the direct feed now. Yeah, but you have the direct feed with the code. Which is surprising, given that we spoke to one gentleman who made an application in March 2024, a paper application, um, received an email on the 22nd of April requesting further information. What did they ask for? An IHT code, an IHT 421 form, which they've stopped using in January. He fairly says to um, us, the probate registry doesn't know its own processes. If you um, let me know the details of the case where I can dig the file yeah. out and we'll give you right back to you with the details. Yeah, thank you. That, that obviously will be troubling if people haven't been trained <laughs> up on, on, on the new system. We will get you to that detail. And finally, you gave us very helpfully the um, wait times, mm -hmm. average wait times, mismeasures. Total amount of the backlog, in just in terms of figures? Yeah, so it's just over 69,000. Um, it's reduced by 30,000 just in the last seven months. Not all of those cases are, are work what we call workable yeah. cases. So of the 69,000, about 37,000 of them are workable. Yeah, and did workable mean, meaning? Means that we have the information and we can work on them. So it excludes stopped and dormant cases. We'll, we'll perhaps come back to those later. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Ms. Krish. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, um, good afternoon, Minister and Ms. Hayes. Um, we've received uh, a number of uh, documents and evidence from different users of the probate system, which you may have had copies of. Um, whilst obviously there were a number of different reasons given for why the delay was occurring, one reason was that uh, digitisation started to take place at the same time as in-person sort of facilities closed down. So people weren't able to speak to anyone, weren't able to get advice, and there were delays caused as a result of that. Now I understand you know, that's being tackled. But one of the things, of course, we've also received uh, a lot of information is regarding the direct impact of the delays on different people, not just individuals, but also, for example, charities. So we received information about £30 million pounds worth of charitable donation got delayed. Um, adult social care systems of the council are chasing up debts as well. That's running into millions mm. as well. And some individuals have even considered suicide due to the fact that they can't continue to look after it. Because if you think about it, you know, one person may be the working person, the, the, the breadwinner, the other isn't. The house may be inherited by that person and they've got nowhere to live. So, I mean, there's a lot of real problems that happen. Do you have a system in place to be able to perhaps deal with those types of uh, situations? I mean, and I, firstly, I mean, is the ministry aware of the fact that you know, the, the devastating impact this can have on many people? Uh, but also, do you have any systems in place to deal with and mitigate this kind of thing? Um, but, I mean, broadly speaking, of course, the department are very conscious of the human impact of delays. Um, 
whether it is exactly the case in terms of where someone is trying to deal with a, uh, get the estate uh, dealt with because they have things like, you know, care fees uh, to deal with. I understand all, all of those issues and we don't minimise the, the human impact at all. And that's why uh, we spent quite a, lot, you know, a real lot of time and resources trying to get the service recovered so that it is delivering for people. Um, on the charity issue, uh, the senior management spend a lot of time to speaking to uh, various stakeholders, um, organisations like, I think, get this right, the Institute of Legacy Management, to try and understand, because they can feed back to, directly to the team what they perceive as to the amount of money outstanding to charities. So there's a variety of ways that the charitable sector can feed into the management team as to what they think is outstanding. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Helen talk about how we can escalate those specifically quite difficult and you know, the human misery type cases, if that makes sense. So, firstly, um, you know, it's important to acknowledge that there have been mistakes made and we apologise for that. We completely understand the human impact of that, not just on individuals, but also on, on, the, set, on the professional sector and the charitable sector. And that's why, as the Minister said, we've engaged extensively with them. If somebody contacts us and, and provides the informa information, like a scenario that you've just described, we have ways to expedite those cases and prioritise them. So if, if, if somebody contacts us, we can do so. Um, but we're also looking, um, we're proactively contacting people who, where, where we can see those cases have waited a long time and inviting them to, for example, we've been running some surgeries recently for very oldest cases. And they're cases that can be stuck for one reason or another. We'll be waiting for something, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, we, we fully understand and, uh, and appreciate the impact it's had. That's why we're working hard to recover the situation. Can I ask, so, so if, I, if it's helpful, so on the professional sector, uh, the team have been doing these clinics with some of the uh, solicitors firms, so they can actually bring to them, you know, why this case been waited so long. Sometimes also an education piece about, so that we can tr talk through the professional as to some of the common problems, but also allows the team to dig out the really thorny cases and resolve them. Then alongside that, one of the big problems you have, and, and members will know this from correspondence, is sometimes the service or you'll have been contacted by a relative or, or maybe the inheritor. But of course, because they are not the applicant, particularly if they've used a solicitor, historically, we've only been able to disclose information about the, the case to the applicants. And if the applicant was the solicitor, we weren't able to discuss it with the executors. We've now changed that process. So as long as they are listed as executors, we can discuss the case with them, even if they're not technically <coughs> applicants. And that should also mean that those really troublesome cases have an ability to be escalated as well. Can I just ask, though, has any thought been set up to perhaps setting up a special unit or actually even an MP's hotline? Because, like, for example, we have with DWP or immigration, because I know from constituents who've come to me who've been battling with this probate thing, and I met some of them who spent years trying to get the, the matter probate, and we did used to ring, and it would take ages for someone to answer, and then they wouldn't really be able to give us much help. And then you had to ring another month later, still tackling the same thing. That's the individuals doing it. And even though the Member of Parliament trying to get through to any numbers, I'm sorry to say, the Minister of Justice, is impossible, whether it's for this or for many other areas. You get swung, you know, there's somebody at the switching centre who doesn't know who to send actually calls to, who expect you to tell them who to send the calls to, and then you never know who you've spoken to. So it's a complete loss in the system. Is there any way that you can have a system where at least for members of Parliament we can have a, a MP's hotline where we can ring on behalf of our constituents? We'd be happy to look at that. Yeah, we don't currently have that. And um, we obviously, when we receive correspondence, we prioritise yes. MP's correspondence, but we'd be happy to look at that, yeah. I'm usually your MP's hotline. It's <laughs> <laughs> probably right, actually. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Chair Lambert. Um, <clears throat> we live in a data driven world, and one of the key things that people use to measure is um, management information. Uh, and um, this measures in all, uh, the, the information you gave earlier was about how you turn things around with the um, with the recovery plan, mm -hmm. and obviously that in involved various metrics and looking at productivity and that sort of stuff. Uh, and so one of the key things that people have asked us about is whether the data that um, HMCTS has can be made more available, uh, and that could help inform what solicitors, what um, practitioners could do in relation to um, help 
smooth things along. So if you knew, for example, that um, a electronic application would take eight weeks, whereas a, a paper one would take uh, 18 weeks, that could help inform what you do. You're also looking at sort of uh, productivity, looking at sort of um, um, how quickly um, you know, emails are responded to or uh, those sorts of things would really benefit solicitors and other practitioners uh, and would also give, um, give you lots of information and help the service run smoother. So is there any barrier to why the data isn't, isn't available? Because that is a big request that we've had from, um, from users. So I've noted the evidence that's previously been provided. So there are two ways in which we already provide data. One is our quarterly statistics. Obviously, there's a lag to them. But we also now produce monthly uh, management information. That only has a six weeks lag, and, and there's a huge, huge amount of information there. Um, what we are finding is that not everybody knows about it or knows where to find it. So there's a, 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 the probate service is probably one of our services that provides the most information about um, the, the examples that you've just given. What we don't publish, and again, this is something I think we should be reflecting on, is um, what people can expect. And I've, we've listened to some of the evidence that has been provided to you where people just don't know. And they could work it out if they looked at the management information, but arguably we should be providing people with a clear expectation. So that is something we can consider. It, and I, I wouldn't know where to find it. So I, yeah. Um, I don't know if you could direct us to that. We can. We, I, I won't read out the, the uh, list now, but yes, we can provide that to the committee. If you get in touch. Yeah. And is there a, some sort of dashboard that you can just uh, look at what the latest quarterly stats uh, are? Or? Uh, that's available. Yeah. Whether it's in a dashboard format, but I'll double check. But the data, is, there's quite a lot of data there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Carter. Um, thank you very much. Um, Helen, can I offer some congratulations to you? Because I think the last time I saw you, we were, we were in Warrington at the Magistrates Indeed. Court, and uh, congratulations on, on your new role. That's why I approached her. Well, I, I, you were there as well, absolutely. I'm slightly worried that that may have, uh, uh, <laughs> have been involved there. But um, can, I, I went back and looked at correspondence that's come into the inquiry, and there are one or two common themes, one of them communication. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, every organisation that has given evidence has said communication from the probate registry is poor. Um, in particular, uh, I think it was the Law Society that, that said, you know, we never see anything in the, um, in the press, in the industry, uh, news media about what's going on mm -hmm. at uh, the probate registry. In fact, the only place that they really managed to get information is from an inquiry that's taking place in the House of Commons. Um, I wonder if you can sort of just set out what work you're doing in terms of informing the sector. And, and I know in particular you've got the probate users group. Um, you know, could, could you just talk us through um, what was that group established to do and how is it working? Yeah, so it was established to, to, exact, to sort of address the point you've just raised and that have a two-way conversation so we can listen to the sector um, and respond to their feedback. Um, we, we have these professional um, user groups, but we have a range of other methods as well. I, I, can, I can provide the committee with exact details on the number of these sessions, but I, I, is that of interest? Okay, so in the, just in the last 12 months, we've had five of these user groups. We've had 10 charity and trust sector sessions. We've had um, 20 or 30 meetings with other parts of the sector three public webinars. We've also had what we call lunch and learn sessions. So that's a, that's a sort of informal conversation between the staff and the practitioners. Um, we've also introduced the surgeries, which we've, um, or the clinics that ministers, uh, Minister Freer has already mentioned. We, we, are, we have listened, though, to the fact that people have said that they, there hasn't been enough um, communication. So over the coming months, we're going to be continuing to do the surgeries. We're going to continue to do these user groups and, and the sessions that I've just described. We're also going to be introducing a monthly newsletter. So that's a written update explaining where we are. I accept your point that we haven't spoken enough about what we're already doing. Um, we're also going to be um, updating gov.uk with more of the information on where the, um, the sort of status of the service right now and what we're doing to address it. So there's a range of things that we're doing um, to address that, that point and hopefully it should improve. The, the Law Society said in their evidence that collaboration has gone. How do you respond to that? I would argue politely that I would say we're working really hard to collaborate with all parts of the sector. 
if that's how they feel, then we will have a conversation with them. We don't want them to feel that way. We're happy to talk to them about what we're doing, um, give them an update on the recovery plan. And, um, you know, for example, we met recently with one um, charity and they, um, a bit like the conversation we've just had about not finding where the management information is, we showed them where it is. We then, in fact, put our analysts in touch with their analysts so that they could have a conversation. So we're open to the feedback. Um, I would sort of respectfully invite them to, to, to talk to us about that and we can, we can speak to them. Can I also say that I'm surprised to hear that from the Law Society because the dialogue between the Ministry and the, uh, the Law Society is frequent. Thank you. Um, do, do you have a set of internal minimum standards? Um, and actually, I've talked about internal. Do you publish them? Do, do you share expectations with users? We don't. Um, we have them internally. You, you don't, you don't no, we have, have them internally, but we don't share them. I'm interested in the committee's view on this. Um, we don't have an issue with sharing them, and it relates to what we were talking about earlier about the information that we already do share um, and how people can use that. So we'd be interested in the committee's views. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think most MPs will appreciate is it's very helpful to say to constituents there are minimum service levels that you can expect to work with. So I think uh, very quick feedback, it would be very, very helpful to, to have that. Um, do you, do you think you've got all the information that you need to progress cases um, in, a, in a sort of reasonable time scale and, and in terms of complex and simple cases? Do, do you sort of differentiate between the two and sort of publish that data? Look, this is what you can expect from a, a simple case and this is what you can expect from a more complex case. So, as I say, we do publish the data on the expected waiting times for different types of cases, so digital cases, which tend to be the more straightforward, although not always, and then the paper cases, which do tend to be more complex. Um, so we do publish that information, yes. Okay. Uh, f final question for, for now, I think. How, how does staff internally feel about where they are and how it's, it's moving forward? And what, what work are you doing to sort of um, rally the troops and keep everybody sort of focused on, on the goal that's needed? I think it would be wrong for me to answer that question just with one description of the staff because I think it does depend on whether you are a member of staff in a probate registry, for example, who has worked in the service for a number of years, or whether you are new to the service and working in one of our Birmingham, uh, in our Birmingham centre. I would say that we have got a new leadership team in place who are working very hard um, to engage the staff. We have a low attrition rate, so we look at you know, how, how, whether people are leaving the service. We have a, a relatively low attrition rate. We've also converted a number of staff from agency contracts um, and that we've supported their applications to become permanent. Um, so we're doing a lot to um, bolster um, and improve the culture within the staff, but it, it's, it's difficult. They're, they're working very hard right now. Um, and so we're trying to keep morale up at the same time as keep productivity up, which is a difficult balance. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mr. Charles Ambosi. Um, so my, my question is about the um, um, staffing and just about the, um, the lack of uh, experienced staff. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there was uh, a loss of um, um, experienced staff and inexperienced staff were uh, brought in. How much do you think that's contributed to the delay that, and the backlog that we currently have? So in the past when we recruited um, more people, of course, they were, um, they were brought in and we needed to then divert experienced staff into training them. Um, we're, we're now at the point where the staff that we have got are largely um, competent in, all, in a range of different skills. And so we're no longer bringing in inexperienced staff. We're trying to maintain a steady workforce. Um, where we may bring in additional resource, and we're doing that right now, um, it's for tasks such as post opening or um, case creation on the system. So um, you don't need an enormous amount of experience to do that. So we're not bringing in inexperienced staff to do work that requires specialist skills. I can give you some more reassurance. I mean, clearly when the reform programme hit and there was a centralisation, there was clearly a loss of experienced staffers people in different parts of the country. That's been addressed. So I can just make sure I give you the, the broad figures. But the number of staff that are trained to complete examining in like non-professional applications, I'm just members of the public, uh, that has almost doubled uh, since June 2023. The number of staff 
trained to deal with professional applications has doubled since June 2023. The number of staff that are trained to complete examining and testancy applications, that has uh, nearly tripled, it's more than tripled, and the number of staff trained to do kind of the complex and other uh, journeys of uh, uh, the application, uh, that has uh, again nearly tripled. So there's been a significant investment in staff and training. Yeah. I was going to ask, and are these new staff or are they staff within HMCTS? It'll be a, well, there'll be a mixture. These are all HMCTS staff. Um, some were recruited from outside, isn't yes, it? Yes, some have been, yeah. But have they been taken from somewhere else in HMCTS? A small number have been, yes. And has that had any impact on the service elsewhere in HMCTS? Have they been, I'm no. assuming they weren't doing it, they weren't just sitting around just waiting to be called up to do probate work? It's not unusual that within a department you'll have people who may move to different roles. Um, the small number of people who used to work in probate that have returned to the probate service hasn't had, a, hasn't had an impact on the roles that they're doing because they would effectively be backfilled in the roles that they had moved on to. And do we know what the numbers are of staff that have been redeployed from within HMCTS and the new ones that have been... Uh, I don't have that figure. We can provide it if that is of interest. Thanks very much, Ms. Davison. Thank you, um, and thank you for, for joining us today. We spoke to some service users this morning, and I won't go over again some of the issues they've had with, with actual delivery, but we did discuss with them whether they considered the, the probate fee that's chargeable actual value for money based on that service level. What do you think? Depends on the experience you've had. <laughs> Which is the very problem, isn't it? I mean, clearly, the, the vast bulk of the, the vast bulk of applications go through uh, with you know relative uh, relative straightforwardness. Um, if you've had a bad experience, then clearly it doesn't matter whether it's five pounds or three hundred pounds; it won't be value for money. Um, we are, I mean, certainly when we look at the fee, it has to reflect the cost of operating the service and its cost recovery. And so the actual fee is reflecting the amount of work that goes in. There's an awful lot of work that goes in behind the scenes to, uh, to grant a case. And so, yes, I mean, we wouldn't necessarily... I mean, I, before I agree to an increase in fee, particularly when a service is going through recovery, um, we do have a, a long consideration whether it's justifiable. But it is about cost recovery, so on the whole, I would say yes. And are those costs being effectively recovered from the fees that are being brought in? Yep. I mean, certainly the data we have, the analysis yeah. is that it is recovering the cost. Yep. Okay. There's one bit of service that we do for free, which is the pre-application advice, particularly to follow the professional service, which is debatable whether that should be chargeable. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, it's currently a free service. Um, my personal opinion, so this is not necessarily a, a departmental view yet, is that it saves the department money because if it comes into the application is then received in a good state, then it will go through more smoothly. So by not char by giving advice for free at the, the front end, it actually goes through smoothly. Uh, the danger is is that um, you can start charging for the service and you don't necessarily uh, get a um, you just get a bit more money, but you don't get a better quality mm. product coming into the system. Yeah, makes sense. Is it pure cost recovery, or is there any modest profit made? I don't think we're allowed to make a profit, Sir Bob. So it's pure cost recovery. Every, every day. Well, I think the yeah. analysis is yeah. it is cost recovery, and we look at it every year. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Every two years, I think. Every it two is years. every two years. Yeah. Every two yeah. years. Yeah. Okay, fine. Mr. Timson. Is it? You? No. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, you mentioned earlier dormant cases, and also mentioned stopped cases. For those who are watching, could you just explain the difference between the two? Yep. <laughs> um, so a stopped case is where we need to get more information, so we'll put a stop on the case and we'll request more information. A dormant case is a case that's been in the system for six months or longer where no action has been, uh, so we've had no information, no action has been taken on the case, it falls into dormant. I do need to say that no cases have become dormant as a consequence of the delays to the, the service, um, so um, all case, we're, that's why we've been focusing on the oldest workable cases. OK, we'll come on to that last point in a second. You said earlier that you had 69,000 cases currently in the system, uh, of which I think you said 37,000 were workable, but the rest were stopped or dormant. So out of those that are either stopped or dormant, how many are dormant? I don't have that figure immediately to hand. Yeah. We can provide that figure. Now, one of the issues that's been raised with us is 
the visibility of dormant cases and those who uh, have applied for probate knowing that their case is dormant. Um, the probate IT system, uh, is it right to say that it can't filter cases between them being active and dormant? No, we, we can filter them. So if, a, if somebody contacts us relating to a case that is dormant, it will immediately go to the top of our oldest cases um, workable queue, if that makes sense. So it can, it can lie dormant for years, and as soon as we get contact, it, it stops being dormant and it goes into our workable queue. How would an applicant know that a case is dormant unless they contacted the, reg the probate registry? Because they're not notified, are they, if it becomes dormant, i.e. six months of inactivity? They will have been notified of a stop, so they'd be, they will have been requested to provide additional information. Yeah. And if that information is not provided, then it will eventually go dormant. So what happens if a case on application goes to a specialist within your team who is then unable to reach that case for whatever reason, workload, uh, within that six-month period, um, in, and which then triggers the dormant status of that case. How would the applicant know that? And that shouldn't happen because... Well, we've been... Have you, we've okay. had other evidence that that is, it has happened. I'd be very keen to look at that, that case um, and any case that, um, that has had that experience because um, it, there are no cases... Well, I, until you've just said that, I'm not aware of any cases that have become dormant because of a delay to the service. Is there a, a way, or are you considering looking at enabling uh, the notification of applicants upon a case becoming dormant? Because there is a risk, otherwise we've been told that it becomes what's sometimes termed as a lost case. Yeah, so this is something we have given some thoughts to. Um, if we were to write out to people who have a case that is dormant. Right now, if we did that, we think that we would, uh, we would open the floodgates to more cases coming to a system that's already tr in recovery and we think that could compromise the cases that are live now and our ability to get through them. Um, further down the line, let's say in September when the service is more stable, we would be open to um, proactively going out and contacting um, people who've got cases that have fallen into the dormant status. We would want to consult with our stakeholders before doing that. Some cases lie dormant for many, many years. Um, for all sorts of different reasons. So it is something we are giving some thought to, but just not right now. Because the proportion of applications that are dormant is a sort of a relevant consideration as to whether you should trigger that type of approach. Mm. We're looking for some figures earlier that I asked for. Yeah, no, the figures I've got are, are those who are... It doesn't give me the dormant figures. Right, but do you track the proportion of cases which are dormant? as a proportion of the, the applications that are outstanding. Do you have a, could you follow uh, a number sequence or a chart that would show to me, uh, actually we're, we're eating into those dormant cases or they're growing um, as a proportion of the applications? So we wouldn't be eating into the dormant cases unless we were contacted by a party relating to the case that would then turn it into a live case. Um, so we are able to assess how many dormant cases that we have got, but they are dormant for a reason, usually because we're either waiting on something or um, there's been a decision from one of the parties not to pursue um, the application. Okay. So I'm, just, I'm just trying to establish as part of your recovery plan yeah. what your strategy is to try and ensure that you don't end up with this uh, ongoing level and potentially growing level of dormant cases, that if you don't let the applicant know... Uh, that their case is dormant, they won't then contact to ask what's happening in the case that they don't know is dormant yeah. and therefore it doesn't come active again. They just end up in this vicious cycle of a growing number of dormant cases which could hold the service back if they're not dealt with. So our strategy is to target the oldest cases first and that's why we've been doing that. Um, and as I said earlier, because until you've just said that point about the case that you're aware of that has fallen into dormant, because we're in a situation where... Um, yeah, because we're in a situation where our activity is not leading to more cases becoming dormant, that's why we don't, we don't have a strategy for dealing with the dormant caseload. Now, um, one of my colleagues has, has, uh, has, has reminded me that we do plan to, as I said earlier, 
look at making people aware that their case has gone into dormant, but for the reasons that I've already said, this isn't something we want to do right now because we want to get through the cases that are live now as the priority. So when the, sta when the service has stabilised, that is something we can look at. Um, and I am interested in the case that you've referred to there. Well, it, it, it may be by the time uh, you come to respond to the report of this, Missy, uh, into this inquiry, which will probably take us a little bit nearer to the September date yeah. of equilibrium within the service. If I may also... Or that you can say as to how you're going to... I will also check, that, uh, because that my understanding is if quite why someone who's waiting for probate would keep waiting and waiting without starting to bang on the door. My understanding is that if someone then phones up and says, what's happened to my case, and makes an inquiry, mm -hmm. then the case handler will be able to bring the case up and then it becomes not dormant. So if someone doesn't just lets it sit there for a year, in fact, I think we were discussing the other yeah, day that yeah. the yeah. oldest case is 30 years old, and mm -hmm. suddenly why would you wait 30 years to suddenly contact us for a probate case? But my understanding is that normally when someone then contacts us after a period of time, the system will then pull it out of the dormant pile because it's been activated by an inquiry. But we will find, so we'll come back to you with more specifics on the percentage of the, uh, of the case load that is dormant and when we, looked at, when we were looking to introduce this kind of trigger Yep. At what point do we go back to people and say, by the way, you've still got a, a case with us that we've not resolved yet? Yep. It'd be good to understand a little bit more about how you would start to tackle that, that particular challenge within the system. For instance, do you start off just by trying to deal with some of the very much older cases, take a sample, and then see what sort of response you get? It'd be maybe just a bit more meat on that, that bone would be, would be helpful. I'm going to, uh, because we've got a lot of questions to get through, um, so I'm just going to move on to another issue, uh, which is in relation to access to justice. Uh, and you'll be familiar with the assessment that HMCTS did uh, into the probate system and access to justice, some things that were at the heart of um, the department's uh, sort of core mission. Uh, and in relation to probate, uh, the findings, and it was between 2016 and 2020, uh, I think it was about 100 probate users were part of the... Uh, the findings uh, was that cases from ethnic minority users take longer and are stopped more often than white users. Uh, what action, because we're now four years on since then, what action have you done to try and tackle uh, that aspect yeah. uh, and what improvements uh, has that brought about? Yeah. So we've done some research in response to the Access to Justice report to understand why that was happening. And what we found is that ethnic minority groups tend to be disproportionately affected by a tendency to use um, uh, different naming conventions. They might use those names in the will or in the application itself. And when we examine the case, um, the names must match exactly. And what's happening disproportionately so for ethnic minority groups is they may use um, first and middle names differently, or they may use a westernized version of the name. Um, and then that means that we have to put a stop on the case to go back to the applicant to seek clarity. What we've done in response to that is updated um, the advice that is on gov.uk, and we're, we're in the process now of updating it further. Um, that will happen in um, August of this year to make it clearer what is required. So at the moment, for example, you can now put in your application um, the name that you're known as, um, and that is, that is helping this, uh, this issue. We will keep monitoring it, and, and in response to the Access just, to Justice report, we monitor a range of different data um, that, so that we can track uh, where we're up to in response to the report. And as part of your drive on capability, uh, one of your sort of key four uh, in, improvement um, areas, uh, has that led to any additional training for your staff to, to, to try and tackle this particular issue? Yes, I mean, we've been enhancing the training that is given to all staff on a, in a range of different areas. They are aware that this is an issue, um, but when they examine the case, they have to examine it within the rules that we have. And so they'll be, they'll be examining it and, and have to apply that same test to every case. Really, we want the applications in the first place to come into us um, correctly, and then that enables us to issue the grants. And as I said, it's now four years on since the last mm -hmm. Access to Justice assessment on probate. 
uh, and bearing in mind that from what you say there's been a number of measures taken uh, in the intervening period is it time to, to perhaps review it again to be able to have a, 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 a clear marker against where you were and where you are now? Yes, the Access to Justice report covered um, not only probate but a number of other services and the, we're due to publish an additional assessment uh, later this year. Uh, one more question from me, another subject uh, if I may, uh, our favourite subject of the reform programme. The uh, 1.3 billion so far uh, programme to modernise and digitise much of the court and tribunal service. Uh, the National Audit Office last year in 2023, in their report on the programme more generally, uh, stated that HMCTS had reduced budgets in line with the expected savings of the programme, but without verifying whether the savings had been realised. Now, looking specifically <coughs> probate, uh, what, uh, what is the case for the probate element of the reform programme? Uh, have you reduced budgets in line with expected savings, and how can you demonstrate uh, that those savings uh, have been realised whilst also bringing about the intended benefits? Well, I mean, I, it's before my time, so I don't know the, uh, the, uh, the business plan specifically for probate, but what I can tell you is actually we've invested in the probate service and certainly um, had counties up um, in specifics as to what was signed off when the original uh, reform programme was signed off. I'd have to come back to you with details as to whether the expected savings have been found or found elsewhere, but certainly we've invested quite heavily in recruitment into the probate service. So I think that was one of the, the, the general criticisms from the National Audit Office, is it was very difficult to track um, where the savings had been made, but also whether that had led to the intended benefits. Um, I think broadly speaking, there, there, there have been savings across HMCTS, um, but it's also true to say that the, the reform programme has been, uh, to use the expression, reprofiled, as in scaled back. Um, so, frankly, um, I think it's honest to say that we bit off more than we can chew. Um, it was a very, a very ambitious programme, and now we've gone back to making sure that the core activity is being supported by the reform programme before we get to adventurous. Um, so perhaps the most helpful thing to do, if you could write to the committee with an update on the probate element of the reform programme okay. uh, and, and where that currently sits within the overarching uh, reform programme uh, as we sit here today. Happy to? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I can elaborate a, a bit if it's useful to the committee. In that, um, so there, is, there are financial benefits and then there are benefits to the, <coughs> the delivery and the efficiency of the service. So we would say that the benefits of the programme have, in relation to probate have been partially met in that we've introduced a new system that is easier for people, for people to access. Now 80% of all of the applications are done digitally people can apply from anywhere, they don't have to go to a probate registry, so they are benefits, we would argue, to the way that the service operates. But as the Minister have sa has said, we have increased our headcount um, to support our recovery efforts. And of course, when we set out on the reform journey, that was not the original intention. Um, so we can provide more detail as to how that has, um, how, how that has uh, developed over time, but there are sort of benefits in relation to people and benefits in relation to the service that's delivered. Thanks very much, Ms. Davis. Thank you. Um, for the <coughs> sounding like a kind of prophet of doom, um, we do have a, an ageing population at the moment, and we saw 2023 have the I think, second highest number of mobile applications on record. Um, we do expect those numbers to rise with that ageing population, and also the number of kind of contested cases to also rise. So, what kind of horizon scanning has been done, and what plans are in place to kind of um, expand the service and to increase capacity? Um, so we have, we have uh, people who, in my team that uh, look at death rate data, mm -hmm. and that's what leads to our calculation of a forecast of receipts. So we track that very carefully, so we, we have an expected number of receipts that come through to us. And as we've already said, there, is a, there has been an increase in, in the death rate, and therefore we need to uh, adjust our um, workforce accordingly. If our forecasts were to show a, 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 a spike in, in receipts, for example, or any other event that could lead to an increase, we would adjust our um, workforce in response to that. So we have ways of doing that. Um, so, um, so, yeah, at the moment we have enough resource to um, deliver the service, mm -hmm. accepting the delays that we, we are all 
hear and aware of. And you've just said there that there, there is sort of flex yep. built in if needed. Can you elaborate a little bit on how that would work? So I currently have about 10% of a flexible workforce within my total workforce in, in probate. Um, as I say, we've, we've actually increased the proportion of permanent workforce. Um, the probate service is one of a number of services that are delivered under the National Services Directorate, for which I'm responsible. Um, let's, and, and our allocations are set annually. So if we were to say that we are expecting an increase in demand, that would be the point at which within HMCGS we'd make a decision over the appropriate resource for the service. And that would be, let's say, I would argue, um, we would need more resource to deliver um, a, a higher output, for example. Um, so these things happen annually and we, we assess our budgets at that point. You talked about your, your kind of crack team of statisticians who examine things like death data. But if you look at things like political scenario, because we've seen spikes in recent years with tax changes, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Um, and um, if and there's nothing on at the moment for it. So say if we thought there was a big risk mm -hmm. um, that could lead to a spike in uh, receipts, that would be something that we would plan for and we'd have a mitigation plan for that. At the moment, we are not seeing anything um, that we think would lead to a, a sudden spike in applications. Mm -hmm. If we did, we would respond to that. Can, can you just elaborate for us on, on what type of events they, they could be, sort of hypothetically, the, the sort of events that could lead to those spikes? Well, um, so HMCTS, along with probably now most organisations, has a, have a national risk register for another pandemic, let's say. And in the probate service, of course, that is uh, an area that would be directly affected. Um, so that would be something that we would think about. Um, but the death rate data and our, is, is really the, the, the data that is most relevant to the probate service. And as I said earlier, our receipts are actually tracking below forecast mm -hmm. so they're, they're up but they're not up as much as we expected them to be mm -hmm. so um, and just on that point again about um, workforce flexibility which is reassuring to hear when it comes to those more complicated cases mm -hmm. where there may be kind of contests is that a sufficiently skilled workforce to be able to sort of fill in those gaps mm -hmm. Um, that has been a problem area for us. We didn't have enough people who could deal with those very complex cases, but part of the recovery plan has been to build up the capability. And so we do now think, uh, and the Minister shared earlier the number of people who are skilled um, to, to do those cases, we do now think we have enough people to do those more complex cases, yeah. And that's that's um, incredibly reassuring to hear. Um, can we talk a little bit about, about the kind of rules behind probate? Because they're, they're literally older than me. They're 37. I'm a, a little bit below that. Do, do we think it... Uh, sorry, guys. Um, do, do we think there is kind of time and scope for examining some of those rules? So look at, for example, um, non-contentious probate. And we heard from a, a, some, a user today who gave a, an example where there are only two surviving children, no surviving partner, and yet they were still facing complications as part of the application when it seems quite clear-cut to, to an outsider like me that that should fly through without any uh, any complication. Yeah, so we have updated the non-contentious um, rules, uh, probate rules, um, five times um, over the last few years. Um, and um, there, I think um, in a previous evidence session, there was reference to a working group, a judicially set up um, working group. Um, and some of the findings of that have already been implemented. As I say, we've updated the rules uh, on multiple occasions. Um, we would be open to looking at whether we needed to look at the rules again, but that would be a decision that would need to be taken by ministers. Um, at the moment, we think we can update the rules as and when we need to within the normal confines of how that happens. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, Minister, I can bring you in to just check that you'd be open to that as well, potentially. I'd be very happy to raise the threshold for when probate kicks in, and I'd be very happy to see the inheritance tax threshold raised mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, um, not least because it would ease the uh, pressure on the department as well, mm -hmm. on the service. Yeah. Um, sort of a, a similar potential reform, the Law Commission is currently consulting on um, electronic wills, which is a, a kind of tech head millennial to me seems, seems like a very sensible proposal. But what would that mean for the probate registry? And are you undertaking kind of early preparations for that in case they are kind of recommended? How long have you got? <laughs> got a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the problems we, I mean, obviously we have to wait for the Law Commission to yes. report, um, but you may know we've started a consultation on <coughs> the scrapping of the paper wills, which I store 110 million of them going back to 1858, uh, even though we have digital copies of quite a lot of them as well. So the consultation on removing the paper copy after a period of time, uh, let's say, has stirred up a hornet's nest. Mm -hmm. um, so quite a few people have said that they still want the ability to go and physically touch uh, the paper will. Mm -hmm. um, so 
that consultation is still currently being, I think we've had about 1,600 mm -hmm. responses, so that's still got to be analysed. But storing paper copies back to 1858 does cost £4.5 million a year. Um, so whilst I can't prejudge the consultation, I think my views have been fairly well trailed. Um, but I understand that the, 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 uh, those who, you know, the genealogists and those who actually want to go and see, the question is, you know, what happens to someone who becomes famous after the, the proposed consulate cut up is of, of very valid challenges. Um, but equally, do we these days need to have paper copies of 100, you know, 110 million paper copies in an aircraft hangar? So we'll look forward to seeing what the Law Commission say. Going fully digital does have its problems, um, so not least do you choose a format that remains usable in 20 years' time? You know, had we chosen Betamax 30 years ago, before your time, um, we would now be in trouble. Had we chosen Blu-ray a few years ago, we'd now be in trouble. So that's always a difficulty with digitisation, is that you have to constantly take a system and then completely readapt it uh, as technology changes. So it's something we're looking at very carefully, but it's, it's not an easy one to uh, get right. And do you think, this is, this is a bit broader, but do you think across government we're good at making those sort of decisions around future technologies? I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the difficulty is, is that, you know, we are in a, the problem is, is that the people who want paper copies are quite a, it's quite a niche um, mm. interest in, in genealogy. The vast bulk of the population would never want to go and see a will, mm -hmm. but it's an important part of, of our history. Um, so physically go and see someone famous as well. And of course the difficulty is if someone famous dies, you know they're famous. But the case that often is used is Alan Turing. When he died, he wasn't famous, he is now. But we'd have destroyed his will based on the consultation. So that's where we have to learn how to reflex. Mm -hmm. But are we the right people to be making the decisions on future technology? No, we're the wrong age group. But unfortunately we are the ones tasked with making those decisions. Thank you. A lot of process in the courts has been modernised, uh, of course. You think of the, the changes to the civil procedure rules, for example. They've been rewritten to put them in modern language. We don't uh, issue writs anymore. Uh, we don't talk about plaintiffs uh, and so on. Uh, that's been common uh, across most of the, of, of the courts. The one place that we haven't done that is the probate rules. Mm. We're still using old-fashioned language. We're still working on language from Victorian uh, statutes are, are updated. Um, isn't it about time that we thought about that? Absolutely, uh, and if I had my way, I'd have a tidying up bill in front of Parliament very quickly. Not just probate, but if we look at the coronial service, much of my portfolio yep. is dated and dates back to Victorian legislation. Yep. Much of what I want to change re requires primary legislation. Yep. Uh, and so there's a very strong argument that the next Parliament has to do a bit of a tidy up on mm. various bits, of the archaic bits of the justice system. Changing the rules actually wouldn't require legislation. And what we've been told is that there was a working party in 2008-2009 that found that the rules weren't fit for purpose and recommended change. So you could actually bat on with that. Um, for example, you've got the Law Commission working on electronic wills. Well, I think I said, going, to, going to them and saying, let's have a look at the rules as well. I think Mr. said that the rules have been changed on probate five yeah. times. Yeah. So I'm always happy to look at that. But anything more fundamental um, may need legislation. Obviously, the idea being we want to make it more friendly to the individual, the layperson, without the need uh, to go through a lawyer. And that was the whole point of the simplification of language. I couldn't possibly comment claim. on whether we would still continue to need lawyers or not. So that's... So you're not ruling out that the idea that you could actually move swiftly on that? Even if it's an I'm, sure we, I'm sure we can always look at the rules, but I, I suspect that there will always be a need for lawyers, Sir, Sir Bob. Some will probably be reassured about that at any rate, Mr. Minister. Uh, but just, just, just moving on then, um, we know that what, what happens, uh, of course, is that the um, original documents, we talk about original documents, actually they have to be, let's say normally you'll make an application that's online, sometimes by paper, but the original documents we've been talking about have to be sent uh, to a, a scanning centre so they can be scanned and then married up uh, with the online application. In fact, some of us went to see uh, the, uh, the, the, the centre up in, up in Harley. Uh, as it's, uh, it's done by a commercial third-party provider, is that right? Yes. Uh, and um, how long does it take for that operation, do you know, to take place? Yeah, so they get about 1,200 um, cases a day. 
and they need to scan them all in within one day. Yep. Um, they are meeting that service level agreement at the moment. Yes, yeah, so the SLA is within one day, yes. and certainly even with a weekend, 48 hours yeah. w w would be enough to get it through. So you may not have the right stat, but I think it's about 48,000 pages a day. Yeah, that's right. It's a substantial amount. Uh, and, and I must say, I think those who went were impressed with the efficiency mm -hmm. uh, of the operation there. But that, that's why I find it sort of perplexing when we then get evidence from um, highly experienced practitioners in this field saying that there also appears to be a two to two and a half week delay between documents being received by the probate registry uh, and these being recorded against the probate application. Now, it's not that that delay isn't happening in the scanning centre, that's for sure. That's been, as you say, 24, 48 hours. Yeah. So where's the delay happening? Somewhere else in the, CP, in the HMCTS's system. So when, after it's scanned, it's immediately married up to an application number um, and there are forensic checks that the, the scanning yeah. firm do. It's all done um, within that period, uh, isn't and, it? And effectively that then become, that yeah. goes into our workable queue. I think there are some cases that when they are applied for on paper, yeah. um, they will be opened in our Newcastle um, yeah. probate registry. And then, so, depending on the nature of that case, they may then be sent to, uh, they yeah. may be then sent to yeah. Excella um, by us to then be uploaded. So it could be those cases, um, but they are ones where the individual has chosen to submit a paper application. Um, and that's partly the reason why there is a difference between paper and digital time. Are you saying there'd be no such delay in relation to a digital application? If there was a digital application and all of the information was there and it went to Excella, it could be uploaded onto our system within the day. I see. Uh, and uh, then just uh, moving on as far as uh, the, those processes are, are, are concerned, um, okay, can you just help me about uh, th this point? It, it, it seems seem, seem to me to be interesting. Do you have... Do you keep statistics? Right, yeah, you've got some, some further information if you want to let us know. Um, yeah, it, it, it's to make a... So if a case, um, it, mm. if, there, if there is something m missing information, mm. let's say when it goes to Excella, it might be, there might, there might be a reason, that might be a reason why there is a, a, a delay, but most, most of the cases go through and get uploaded straight away. You, you told us about your service yep. Do you have statistics, perhaps you could send to us if you don't have them today, about what percentage may fall into that category where there might be a delay yep. rather than it being uploaded within the 24 hours? Yeah, so we do have some cases that need to be re-scanned and we do mm. have that information. Um, I, I, I'll, I can look it up and If you can look it up and send you. it to us, that, yeah, that, it, that, that would be interesting. It's a small proportion that need to be re-scanned and that might be, for example, um, when the registry or the, the case examiner looks at it, they might find it missing pages when it's been scanned and that will lead to a re-scan request. Um, so it's cases like that that might fall into that category. Mr Chairman, yes. so you know, on our trip yesterday we found it was a very professional operation um, scanning was uh, we were some scanning, you know, living the dream doesn't get more exciting than that. Um, but it was, um, um, but no, they were very diligent. They they scanned quite carefully uh, and um, uh, they talked us through the entire process. Um, and uh, just on the point that the minister made about storage of uh, paper documents, they did have um, box, boxes of paper waiting to be scored because they were waiting for the grant of probate, mm -hmm. or they could then send it off to Iron Mountain for storage in Birmingham. So again, there's, there's an, another sort of paper delay there that uh, they, they had. Uh, but on the whole, we were very impressed with um, how well run it was, um, and um, we certainly saw no evidence of any delay from their part. They were, they were hitting their targets, uh, and uh, we were very impressed with them. It, it's sometimes been suggested by, um, again, witnesses to us, uh, that there might be occasions when there's a problem where uh, only one page of a, uh, a, will, a double sided will is copied or, or that something is too big. Now, they seem to have cut systems with coping uh, with that. Do you track again? Do you have any figures or statistics to indicate when there might be some further information required because uh, a page is missing, which might be a copying error or, or because there's been difficulty scanning what, yeah. you know, the old days, folio or full scat wills? There are probably less of them now. Do you have any stats around that? We do. We've that? got information on the number of rescan requests. I think it's yeah. about 1,600 a year, but I will double check that. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's, so it's 1,679 for the whole of 2023. Okay, yeah. that, 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 that's very helpful. Um, I'm told that Excel are actually not, uh, uh, not keeping the contract and it's going to be moved to, to, to Iron Mountain. Is that right? Um, 
there are negotiations and there are um, uh, procedures going through now that I wouldn't be able to talk about freely because they would be commercially sensitive, but the contract for this service is being looked at, yes. Well, we were told about it quite openly, but the department never bothered to tell us until we, until we went there. Okay. Some of us might find that unsatisfactory. Okay. It could be uh, noted. Uh, because Normally, disclose contract negotiations. We're not interested in the details of contract negotiations, just the fact that there was a change. So it was volunteered quite openly at the time, but none of us knew about it in advance. Which... Okay, noted. Just, just looking at some of the ways in which we might deal with scanning going forward, um, th there has been uh, uh, some uh, suggestion in the past, I think, about whether or not it might be possible for practitioners uh, to uh, do, do the scanning and upload in the solicitor's offices, for example, and then send the, the, the certified copy. Has any more thought been given to that? So we, we have looked at that, and um, at the moment, the, um, so it is a requirement in legislation for the original will um, to be received um, by the registry um, and then deposited in the probate registry. And when we look at the original will, and, and the scanning firm do this for us as well, they, do, they undertake a forensic check yes, of that will. That. Um, now, we have considered the evidence that's already been provided to you, and we've looked at this. So the forensic check that has been undertaken just in 2023, there were 3,500 um, cases that were submitted by solicitors' firms that had to be stopped. Um, because there was either missing information or it wasn't the original will. So what we'd be concerned about, aside from the need to change legislation for us to be able to do this, but if we did do that, we would be concerned that we'd be introducing risk into the system because we already know so that, that some of the cases that are submitted by solicitors, there, are, there is missing information. But if we were to change that, we would need to change legislation, and that's not something that is currently... And what percentage is that 3,500, the total number of applications? It's 2.3% um, of all legal professional applications. About 2%, yeah. Okay, so that, that's the element of risk yeah. that you look at. And 98% isn't a risk. Right. Okay. Uh, and uh, just uh, looking at one, one other thing, I don't know if you looked at this, I know there's been some discussion about whether or not um, you could look at what's done by the land registry. Uh, and you're, you're aware of their system where the, the, the professional has an account, so the firm solicitors or, or debates or whatever, set, sets up a, uh, a secure single user account, they complete the application, there they can upload the original, the scan of the original deeds, for example, and so on, uh, and uh, uh, they confirm that they hold the original, send it if required. Subject to the legislation, would that be a practical way forward to adopt the same system again, not reinventing the wheel, something another HMCTS uh, agency actually uses already? I was happy to look at best practice. Thanks uh, very much. Um, Mr Carter. Um, can I change tack slightly? Um, and just, again, looking back at the written evidence that we've had in, um, there's a suggestion from the uh, Empty Homes Network that delays in probate are causing problems uh, with the number of empty homes in communities and having a knock-on impact in the number of uh, homes that are being reclassified to Class F, so uh, council tax is then not payable to them. Um, I, I, I've got a particular example in my constituency, for example. Grappen Hall Rectory has been empty for four years, uh, under probate, um, and uh, despite my attempts to make inquiries and the council's attempts to make inquiries, nobody can quite work out why nothing is moving forward on it. Um, and uh, it's a, um, a, a grade two listed building. Uh, it's been damaged by arson. Uh, it looks a terrible state. Uh, and people that live around it want an answer. But the answer is it's in probate. Um, and I wonder if um, you can sort of give a little bit more of a, a, a sort of view on discussions you're having about um, probate in the context of empty homes. That's something that we can talk to our user groups about. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the case that you referred to. Um, what we're finding is that with our very oldest cases, they, there is a, a number of different factors that are leading to the delay, not just the probate, um, the, the waiting for the probate grant. So I'd be very happy to look into the, the example you've just given there. Great. I look forward to writing on that. I mean, it, it, it seems to be a topic that's 
coming up in, in the press in various areas. I mean, just, just for example, in I think it was the Swindon Advertiser, housing experts, Swindon Borough Council say one of the main reasons why a house becomes empty is because of problems with probate. Uh, and, you know, it sort of follows. If somebody dies and it goes into probate, you can't move into the house, you can't do anything with the house uh, until the probate is, is granted. I'd want to check that. In fact, so I, I will contact my colleagues at the Department for Housing as a former leader of a very large council in the country, probate was not a particularly big factor in the number of uh, unoccupied well, dwellings. I wasn't then, Minister, but given there are 30,000 waiting cases and many of them will have houses involved, perhaps that is now a, an area to look at. More than happy to have a look at it, but I have to say that's the first time it's been raised with me that it's contributing to uh, empty homes not being used. So more than happy to check with our colleagues in the uh, Department for Housing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Timson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, amazingly, uh, fake wills are a thing, and fraud is something which uh, pervades uh, probate uh, as well as uh, lots of other aspects of people's lives. Uh, but how much do you have insight into the scale, the prevalence? of fraud and how are you going about trying to identify, uh, report, tackle and try and prevent in the first place? Yeah, so we have a range of quality assurance um, processes relating to this service, so um, to try and identify potential fraud and that includes all of the many checks that our examiners need to undertake to ensure the validity of the will, um, and that includes that the forensic check that I have already referred to. Um, I have looked into the extent of um, fraud in the service that we are aware of. Um, obviously, our role is, is limited to examining the will and issuing the grant, but um, out the, there's a very small number of counter-fraud investigations that have happened within HMCTS. Um, the number, I'm happy to share it with you, we've recorded um, six last year. None of, we've had no such cases recorded this year. Um, so our responsibility extends to the validity of the will, um, and so that's something that um, clearly we take very seriously, and that's, um, that's why we have so many checks. Because, of course, there's, there's other elements of, of probate that fraud could mm -hmm. play a part. Uh, you've, you've touched on the will itself, and, of course, people forget it's a legal document with legal responsibilities. Uh, it's not something to, uh, to sort of play, um, play games with. Uh, but there's also, fraud could be for people who, who are not then uh, paying bequests that are in a will. Uh, there's also people fraudulently applying for the right to administer estates. Is there a role for the probate registry or working with other agencies in trying to bear down on some of that uh, type of fraudulent behaviour? So if that sort of fraudulent uh, behaviour were to occur, it would be a criminal matter. HMCGS does not have a role in that respect. With your digital... Uh, system. Uh, our understanding is, is that you don't have a, an ID verification uh, on the digital probate system, uh, which could leave it open to fraudulent activity. First of all, is that correct? Um, and if so, is there anything you're going to do to try and ensure that um, you reduce the, the chances of that happening in the future? So we assess the validity of the will and we will look at the integrity of the um, signature and the signatures on the will and the wording of the will. Um, the examiners will look at things like the condition of that signature, whether it's shaky or whether it's not quite in the right place, that kind of thing. But we don't cross-reference the, the signature um, to other identification checks. I think that would be, um, I mean, that's something that we'd be interested in the committee's views on, but it would be very um, labour-intensive for us to to introduce that check because it would involve us needing to cross-reference with other systems. Um, at the moment, we have no plans to introduce that. Well, I'm perhaps interested in the Minister's view on this, bearing in mind we've brought in uh, voter identification, which we pretty much all of us remembered to take to the polling station, with the odd exception. You had to go back and find it from somewhere else. Um, is, is this perhaps an area, accepting the, the very valid point about workload and uh, at a time when you're trying to uh, push through the backlog. Um, is this something that's, that's worth looking at? Uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, certainly, I think the, the, there's a big challenge about, you know, the tell government wants, you know, you know, 
we have a, a whole raft of data between HMRC and DWP and the whole various government departments that we should be able to electronically cross-reference. Um, that's a challenge. So in different parts of my portfolio, I've been <coughs> in a drawn-out process to get DWP and the, and the revenue to talk to us and share data um, because of legislative barriers. Um, but I think it's, um, it's something I'd probably prefer to take up it's a very valid take up with the Cabinet Office because I think there's a, probably a big piece of work for government to do about tell government one. So whichever bit of government you touch, you're able to verify yourself. Uh, and so I think that is a very valid challenge. I'm not sure that the probate team are best placed to drive that. So I think it's a big piece of cross-government work. I mean, when someone dies, you tell the government once. And it cancels your council tax, it cancels your pension. So it's not beyond the wit of government to be able to pull a bit more of that data in. Yeah, so I'll raise that with the Cabinet Office. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mr Alley. Thank you, Chair. Um, last time I was asking a question of the Ministers and we were close to the votes and I've got a message we might get votes short. There seems to be a pattern here. <laughs> Ministers rejected um, the 2013 Legal Services Board recommendations to regulate uh, will writing in favour of better consumer guide. Uh, the CMA Competitions and Market Authority is now consulting uh, on whether more guidance for will writing and prepaid uh, probate services is required because of harmful practices uh, in the sector. Is that evidence that the consumer education approach has failed? Uh, and if so, is it time to look again at regulating the sector? Certainly I'd have to look and see what the CMA come out with. Uh, and if they have very strong evidence um, that there needs to be further steps to look at the, how we, the sector regulates itself or whether it needs statutory regulation, very happy to look at that. Uh, I, I do think that we should never be too hard and fast on ruling things in and out because things change. We've seen other parts of my portfolio. What was thought to be the right approach several years ago is now not the right approach. So I want to see what the CMA uh, suggest they should do, whether uh, and how tough that regulation would be, whether it's self-regulation or statute regulation. So I'm more than happy to look at it. That's fair enough. And we've also heard uh, concerns that delays have opened uh, a gap in the market for advisors claiming they can help uh, clients or avoid uh, probate uh, completely. Uh, have you made any assessment uh, of the extent of the problem? Not that I'm aware of. Certainly our approach would be that whether people are exploiting delays, um, as I said earlier on by September we'd expect the, uh, the workable caseload to be back at around about the 30,000 level, then hopefully that would, if you like, take away the imperative of people to use so-called advisors. Okay. Uh, the reason I think I'm particularly interested in that Minister uh, is the growth of what's called prepaid probate plans. Um, and uh, in 2023 the Financial Conduct Authority issued a warning uh, about such plans, uh, saying that very often you remember them are the unregulated funeral uh, plan provider uh, companies, that some of those, once regulation was brought in around funeral plans, had moved uh, into uh, a currently unregulated sector uh, around prepaid probate. And potentially is there a gap? I think that's are you perhaps... Uh, possibly, and, and, and obviously it depends on what the CMA recommend. Yeah, yeah. And you're, but subject to that, you're, you're, you're happy uh, to, to look at that. Okay. Um, Ms Davison. Thank you. Um, so, Minister, you talked a little bit earlier about inheritance tax, so I want to talk a bit about that now. Um, I, th I think uh, roughly 40% of estates have to file a sort of inheritance tax form, and yet only around 4% will actually pay anything, which obviously incurs not just kind of stress and, and, and time pressures, but also in some cases professional services costs as well. Um, and yet also if there are delays in probate being granted, there can then be interest accrued on the actual amount owed. So what, what kind of consideration has been had and have any discussions been had with HMRC about those delays and specifically on the point of interest? Um, I'm not sure whether we've discussed with HMRC the specific points relating to interest. We meet them very regularly. We met them on average about twice a month um, just in the last, in the last 12 months. Um, the new changes that were introduced um, have reduced the, the weight uh, for people. So we have reduced the number of cases that are stopped um, uh, because of the need for the um, 
the code. So because we now get that automatically, we're seeing more cases go through right first time. Well, that is reassuring. Has, has any consideration been given to actually changing the sequencing? Because I know that that creates a lot of stress, even if not actual financial pressure. I mean, so now, I mean, I'm currently doing, you know, my laws are currently going through probate, and there will be new houses tax to pay. It's, a, it's, it's an incredible barrier yeah. and burden. But it really is a matter of HRC. It's not one that we would have uh, any real uh, influence on. Mm-hmm. You're a minister, of course you've got influence on it with the right conversations. Have you met the Treasury? That <laughs> <laughs> point. No, thank you. Looking back, I mean, do you think it's probably fair to say that too much was done too quickly and all at the same time when we had all these changes? You know, centralisation, digitisation, all came too much and probably there wasn't enough capacity before your, your watch rider. Is that, would that be a fair observation, do you think? I think the uh, report, the best one in the world, I, I can understand why the department mm. wanted to build a bespoke all singing or dancing answer to the universe. Um, I think it's also fair to say, and the Department of Health has hands up and said there was insufficient, it was far too much too quickly, and there was too little, if you like, uh, early adopter testing. So I think it's true to say that um, too much was tried to do in a, a rapid period of time. I think it's also true to say, I'm not sure the Department had the necessary skills to manage such a large IT. It wasn't just an IT system, it was also a whole business process re-engineering at the same time. So normally you do one and then the other, you don't normally do the two at the same time, because otherwise, you're, until you change your... If the danger is, all you do is put new IT on a pretty ropey system. So normally you change your system and then put the IT in to support it. So I think all of the, all of the criticisms that we've heard from the Audit Office and uh, PAC... Have been, I think PSC was perhaps a bit harsh because the department fessed up to where they got it wrong. But I think if we look back to the business plan, in my personal view, it was overly ambitious. Do you think we lost too many experienced staff in consequence of this? Yes, we did. Um, and another big lesson learned is that I don't think we were listening enough to the staff that were in the probate registries and that were working in probate who were raising concerns. We have addressed that now, um, but uh, yes, I think we did lose a lot of experienced staff. Okay. Uh, What are you planning to do, perhaps, to try and make sure we don't get into that again? Uh, And as I said earlier, we've increased the number of staff that we've got. We've also increased the number of um, skills that the staff that we have got um, are are able to use. So we're intending that um, three-quarters of all of our staff can um, assess both professional and citizen applications as well as at least one other complex um, case type and we should have that in place by the end of July, August, so that's what we're doing to make the service sustainable. Mr Timson. Just just very quickly, when we spoke to people who uh, had been or going through probate earlier today, uh, we, we asked them about what opportunities they had to feed back their experience of the service and they gave us, well, we, we get the sort of standard survey at the end of the telephone call, but actually there's, there doesn't seem to be uh, many opportunities to do so uh, and they would have, I think, perhaps given you some very valuable insights into uh, what didn't work well, perhaps actually what did work well. Mm-hmm. So. In, in looking forward to how you can improve communication, information flow, and the, the feedback you get from uh, many people using the service, uh, are there any other uh, ways that you're considering how you might be able to do that more effectively? Um, yes, so we have now introduced what we call a user-centered design team, and that is um, a group of people, um, so it's a team within HMCTS that is dedicated to engage with a range of different stakeholders, including the public. Um, um, but I'm listening to what you're saying about people who've used the service and whether they feel that they could feel about their experience. Aside from them writing to us, um, there isn't a, a, a brilliant channel of communication I accept, but we, we are trying to address that with this um, user-centred group that I've just referred to. And there's a feedback link on gov.uk. If I can also reassure you, one of the, when I went out to one of the um, probate teams and uh, the registries and dis- discuss with us what causes grief. We just ask the users. You know, we should build systems with the people who are using it, and not in- do it to them. And they they were the ones who told me RHT is one of their biggest causes of grief. And when you ask the question, oh yes, it's all straightforward. It's on the form. Do not send. So I said, can I see the form? Yeah, it's on the form. 
if you know where to look. It's, you know, it's like tiny script. Do not send. I mean, like, that needs to be on the front page and like, you know, this big. And so getting the either users or the actual people in who are actually processing it to design the system mm -hmm. is far better than trying to get some clever clogs for consultancy trying to impose a, an IT system. So that's where I learned most about what we needed to change in the recovery program, is actually by visiting the offices and seeing the forms for myself. Okay. Uh, one of the key people in the system are the registrars, aren't they? And the, we've got about 2.6 at the moment, I think, mm -hmm. full-time equivalent. There used to be 30. Is that an area where perhaps things went too far and we need to add people more back into the system? I mean, that is a key area where we, we lost a lot of expertise. We've adjusted the structure of the registrar structure yeah. now, so we have deputy registrars yeah. and then people working to those registrars, um, and that's what we have now in place, and we think that's sufficient to, to meet the demand. As I say, what we need are more examiners that can assess more cases and more complex cases. Okay. And so what, what, what uh, FT equivalent would you reckon with the um, deputy registrars and so on? That so give the intention is we're, we're very close to achieving one registrar, three deputy registrars, and I think it's a further three or four um, deputies to those deputies, if that makes sense. Confident that would do the job that was once done by 30? Um, yes, I am, because we're increasing, the, well, we're increasing the... Um, resource overall of people who can look at those cases. Mm -hmm. If we started to see that the demand um, wasn't being met, yeah. we would look at that again. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's fair. Both of us have been doing a little bit of travelling, uh, Minister. We both been to, to Singapore uh, earlier in the year to look at the probate service uh, and things there. Mm -hmm. um, that's a digitised system. In fact, I there. met the head of IT last week yeah. to discuss the DigiPass or yeah. Sync SyncPass. Yeah. The SyncPass is very impressive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's very impressive. Yeah, yeah I wonder, but uh, about seven days they're turning around probate there, aren't they? Um, the, the difficulty is, I, I, I wasn't able to actually understand. I'm assuming, as a Commonwealth country, has a similar probate mm. yeah, sure. framework. Yeah, sure. Uh, whether it's exactly the same as ours, I don't know. Um, but in terms of the the compliance of the population to using the past system is very strong. Um, I'm not sure that we are at that point in the UK. Maybe post-COVID, when we got to the vaccine pass, that mm. might have been an opportunity to build on it. Mm. Um, but I think we've moved away from that now. Any so, other message? Yeah. I mean, I, it was an amazing system. Yeah. But it, is, it tends to be a, a largely much more compliant population in terms of technology and government systems. And I'm not quite sure that the UK population is quite in the same place. But it was very impressive. You're making allowance for that, are there other lessons do you think we can... You could well, I, I mean, I looked at a variety of issues across my portfolio yeah. in terms of um, their, their ability to do e-course. I mean, we, we've discussed at length the, the strengths and weaknesses of Common Platform and the reform programme. And certainly I've seen e-court systems in both Singapore and in South Korea and simply thought, why didn't I buy that? Yeah, so... It's, they're not exactly the same, and obviously culture um, and the court system and the judiciary act in a different way, but certainly their ability to drive paper out of the system mm -hmm. is quite phenomenal. Yeah. And if I could copy what Singapore does tomorrow, I would. Yeah. Don't tell the Lady Chief Justice. <laughs> Can I conclude? I think this will probably be the final question. Yes. Um, well done. The... <laughs> Um, when do you think you'll have caught up? When, when will people putting in their probate applications have confidence that they'll get them back within the time frame that you talked? We should achieve that in September of this year. Um, at the moment, we're ahead of um, forecast. I don't want to be too overconfident, given the background. Um, but yes, by September, we're expecting to have recovered. We'll keep a very close eye on that. Um, uh, so we will adjust our resource if we need to. But that's when we expect the service to have stabilised. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sir And Minister, uh, uh, Ms. Bedras, thank you very much uh, for your evidence today. It's been very helpful, very grateful to you. It was a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Minister. <laughs> and, uh, the session is concluded. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.